when to see the way that Life Positive has grown and has blossomed for the last 20 years. Let's begin by just taking a few minutes and closing our eyes. Come back as the eyes close, allow the senses to withdraw from the outer world into the inner world. Meditation is not a dulling of the senses, but rather it is just a shift, a shift of awareness and perception from the outer world to the inner world. Allow the awareness to shift to the inner world. Visions, smells from the outer world will be there. Don't try to fight them off. And yet, don't pay attention to them. Allow them just to flow across your consciousness. Like clouds flow across the blue sky on a windy day. Allow them just to blow across your consciousness. But keep your focus on that blue sky between the clouds. Keep the focus on the space between the thoughts beneath the sounds, beneath the smells. Bring the awareness to the breath. Don't try to change it. Don't manipulate it. Just allow the awareness and the consciousness to merge with the breath as it flows in and flows out. Keeping the awareness merged with the breath. Any thought, any sound, any smell, self to just let go. Let go of another mask that you wear. Another role that you play. Another identity that you hold on to. Another personality. All of these things which are not self. 
as you exhale, just let them go. Breathe them out one by one. And as you exhale, as you let them go, sink deeper and deeper from the not-self, from the masks and the roles and the identities. Allow yourself to sink deeper into the core, the center of the true self. Letting go more and more on each exhalation, sinking deeper and deeper into the core of the being on each exhalation. As we exhale, as we let it go, we are freer and freer to rest in the center, in the core of the self, the source the source of peace, the source of love, the source of consciousness. Allow yourself to rest there. Letting go more and more with each exhalation. Freer and freer to sink deeply and rest in the core of the self. Slowly, take your left hand and put it on the heart center. And then put your right hand on top of your left hand so that your eyes are still closed, but both hands rest on the heart center, on the heart chakra. And on each inhalation, as you inhale, 
feel the heart expand and expand as you carry in on the prawn, on the breath, on the life force. All of that which is sacred, which is holy, which is divine. Breathe it in on each inhalation and feel the heart expand and expand. Feel it grow beneath your hands. Go here. Become this, then I would find peace. Then I would live in peace. And the tragedy of that is that we spend our lives acquiring more and more. And we get farther and farther from peace. Whereas the source of that peace is actually within us. We've been told that there are six main obstacles to peace. And I want to take this time to just speak a little bit about the six obstacles. Because peace is something that if we can just remove the obstacles to it, it is our nature. It's not about getting it. It's about removing the obstacles to it. It's like that story of the, the golden Buddha. There was a, a temple in Thailand or Cambodia where they had a clay Buddha that they'd been worshipping for hundreds of years. And one day the monks in the temple were cleaning this clay Buddha. And they noticed something shining from within it. Very, very gently and carefully, they start cleaning the clay more and more. And that which is shining starts growing more and more. They clear away more and more clay, and the shine is more and more. And finally, they realize that actually there's gold inside. And so they start clearing away the clay more and more, and discover that within this clay Buddha, there was actually a golden Buddha. And the story was that when the invaders had come, the monks in the temple of the golden Buddha were afraid because what the invaders had been doing was coming through and stealing and looting and melting and destroying all of the gold. And so in order to protect this golden Buddha, they covered it with clay. And the good news, of course, was that the Buddha survived. But no one who knew that the Buddha was gold survived. None of the monks did. None of the other devotees had. And so for hundreds of years, they'd been worshipping this clay Buddha. And the reason that I love the story is that it's such a beautiful metaphor for our lives. We identify as clay. We want to be gold, or to have gold. And so what we, what we do is we look outside for how to find gold and stick it onto the clay. And whether we come from a materialistic standpoint, and the gold is 
finances and money and cars and mansions, or whether we come from a more spiritual side. I mean, none of the, the readership of Life Positive or the writers of Life Positive are those who are going to say, oh yeah, everything you know, everything you need is going to come in just a bigger bank account. Luckily, we've gotten, we've gotten beyond that. You've got a team here that's been working for 20 years to help people understand it's not about the gold outside. But sadly, sadly we tend to think about this in, in spiritual ways as well, that okay, so the gold I'm looking for may not be in bricks of gold. It may not be in earrings of gold. It may not be in bedposts of gold. But we still convince ourselves that if I just, if I just could get, you know, a, a teacher's training certificate in this, if I could just become a yoga teacher of that or a meditation teacher of that, or if I just could do this course or get certified in that, or buy this CD, or learn to meditate from that teacher, then I'll have it. And the truth is that it's all already within us. What all of the greatest teachers can do is help us find that which is already within us. It's never about finding the gold outside, finding the peace outside, because then all we do is we're dumping something else on top of the clay. We've still got the clay. We're no closer to experiencing the gold that already is us. We've just dumped another layer of gold-platedness on top of the clay. And what the deepest teaching is, what the greatest teachers remind us, is that it's all about just removing the clay. And so what we embark on is a path to remove the clay. And so when we're looking for peace, when we talk about living in peace and that peace which seems to elude all of us, this is, this is the greatest mantra today. I want peace. I want peace. How do I find peace? Forgetting that it's within. So our, our journey together for a short time is about how can we remove this clay? What's it made up of? And how can we remove it? There's a, a beautiful demonstration, actually, that I'll, I'll begin with. And I love to do this because it, it brings it home, I think, so beautifully. So let's, let's just divide, divide the room right in half here. So those of you to where Sumaji is behind her and on this side, your group A. Those of you to Sumaji's left, my right, your group B. So this group, you're going to chant Om. Let's try it. Go. Yeah, outside, out loud. Great. Group B, your job is to make as much noise, as much ruckus as you possibly can. Okay, let's hear you do that. Not om, not om, you're making noise. Not with om, random ruckus, random noise. Hmm, wreak some havoc in here. Come on. Don't be shy. Can this side can this side make noise? <laughs> Good. Now, I want you both this side doing om, this side making as much noise as you can. Don't be shy. Living a life of peace is not about suppression. 
We're not suppressing anything. This side, make all the noise you can. This side, chant Om. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Okay, great. Now, we're going to do it again. This side needs to be a little bit better. This side's going to be a little bit more enthusiastic. You're going to do it together, and then I'm going to hold up hands. And when I hold up hands, what that means is your side should become quiet. So if I hold up the hand over here, the ohm side becomes quiet. If I hold up the hand over here, the ruckus side becomes quiet. Okay? But for now, we both go together. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Now, Here's why I love this demonstration. I never held up the hand to the Om side. You never stopped. You were going from the beginning. And yet, until I held up the hand over here, we couldn't hear this side. If you had a microphone or a recorder where I am, it just sounds like ruckus. But the minute that they became quiet, we can hear the Aum. It wasn't about bringing in the Aum. I didn't have to tell you all, be louder. All that needed to happen in order to hear the Aum was this side needed to become quiet. And this is what happens for all of us. We look for how to find Aum. How to find peace? What do I have to do? And this example for me is one of the most vivid ways of understanding the paradox of our lives. It's all here. The Om was going the entire time. All we have to do is quiet this side. So let's talk for a few moments, and then I, I, I want to open it up for questions before we conclude. So if someone could just give me a signal at about 5.30. We go till 6, and if someone could just let me know around 5.30, that would be great. So we have plenty of time for questions before we have to wrap it up. So the six main obstacles to peace that we are given, they go together in pairs. They are anger and ego, greed and temptation, attachment and stress. And of course, you could run a two-day workshop on this, and I'm going to have to go through this quickly, but I want to just touch on all six of them, because if you take, if you give yourself a week, Sure, of course. They are, and I'm going to go into them all in more detail, but in short, they are anger and ego, pair one. Greed and temptation, pair two. Attachment and stress, pair three. And they're not in any hierarchical order. If you give yourselves a week, and you say, on day one, I'm going to work on one of them. And for six days, you spend one day a week dedicated to removing each of these. By the seventh day, you'll be able to take that, that day of rest that the, the Judeo-Christian traditions speak about in terms of when they talk about creation. And of course, even for those of us, I was raised in that tradition, but it's not 
not a tradition that I, I practice anymore. And yet the concept of a, a Sabbath, the concept of a day in which we go inward, a day in which our attention, instead of being focused on taking care of things outside, is focused on coming within, focused on the family, focused on our spiritual lives, is a beautiful, a beautiful tradition. And so if we really spend six days removing one of these things each day, the seventh day will automatically become a day of rest. It will become a day in which we realize, oh, I don't have to look for peace. I've discovered it. And then that, that day of, of rest will stay with us. It's not that you have to do this every week. If we do it, if we do it well, we do it in one week. Occasionally, you may have to recharge your batteries with one or more of them, but we take so many courses and so many programs. This is just a, a six-day program. So the first, the first aspect is anger. Anger is something that ruins so many of us. And the first aspect to understand is why do we even get angry? Like, why does it happen? We're peaceful people. We meditate. We pray. We read life positive. We try to implement the teachings. Why do we get angry? What is it that comes over us? What happens? What happens is that we have expectations. We're going to come to more of that when we talk about attachment. But basically what happens is we have an expectation of how the world should be, how people should treat us, how things should operate. Our own preconceived notion. It happens, great. It doesn't happen, we're angry. You stole my peace. I was so at peace until you did this. What does that mean? It means my peace is dependent upon you fulfilling my expectation. We've turned the world into vending machines. You should give me what I want. I've put in my, my rupees, I've pushed my button. What I want should come out. You should treat me how I want you to treat me. You should say the things I want you to say. You should act in the way that I want you to act. Whether it's our families, whether it's our employers, our employees, whether it's our elected officials, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's the traffic on the freeway, whether it's the universe, I have an expectation. And when that expectation is not fulfilled, I get angry. The problem with this is in the, my academic background is in psychology. And in the Western model of psychology, what we're told is you need to express it. And so entire schools of psychology are rooted in teaching us how to express our anger. People pay a lot of money for assertiveness training workshops. I should learn how to assert myself. I should learn how to express And the problem with this, and it's something actually now that even the science of neurology, it, it, for me it's just on a personal level so exciting to watch psychoneurology start to meet spirituality. Because when I first came here 20 years ago, that which I was taught in school was over here. 
that which my guru and the Indian sages were saying was over here, and what I experienced as truth was over here, but I was having to therefore turn my back on what science and psychology and neurology said. And slowly over the last couple of decades, it's been really exciting to watch science come this way. Now they're starting to quote unquote discover, because they would never say they're starting to realize. They're actually discovering it. Forget the fact that it was written about thousands of years ago in our scriptures. Forget the fact that our saints and sages have been saying this for thousands of years. They're now discovering it. And what they're discovering is that which we term sanskaras. They call it neural programming, neuronal networks. But it's the exact same thing. And so take, for example, this pad of paper. If I take a glass of water and I pour it over this, let's say this is a rock, and I pour the water over the rock, it's flat. The water will flow evenly over the face of this rock. This is what you could call my own consciousness, my nature, or in a neurologic standpoint, you could call it my brain. It doesn't matter what we call it. It's the basis upon which I live and experience the world and act. So here it is flat. But then if I take this pencil or my fingernail or anything, and I start running a groove over and over and over and over in one place. Now I've developed a groove in it. When I take the water now and I pour the water over, what's going to happen? Where's the water going to go? In the groove. And when the water goes in the groove, then what happens to the groove? It gets deeper. This is how rivers cut through mountains. This is what happens when we act out our anger. Every single time you yell in anger, every time you slam a door in anger, every time you have a temper tantrum in anger, you haven't actually let go of the anger. What you've done is created a sanskara, a groove, a neural patterning that means that next time you are more likely to get angry, to slam a door, to throw a temper tantrum. Every single time I do it, I'm making the groove deeper. This is when we talk about sanskaras, our patterns. And so when we experience anger, there's three ways to deal with anger. One is expression. When we express it through, I'm slamming a door, I'm shouting, I'm hitting someone, I'm having a temper tantrum, this is just creating a groove. It means that next time, I'm more likely to do it. And then what happens is we start acting without even realizing it. In science, they say, neurons that fire together, wire together. What that means is, if frustration and slapping, you do something that makes me frustrated, I pick up my hand and slap you. Hmm. Felt good. Release of my frustration. I've now wired that. Next time, I'm more likely to do it. Ah, again, release. More likely to do it the next time. Release. What happens is, that starts to wired together in such a way that now I don't even know who slapped you. I'm not even conscious of it until it's over. And this is when we say, I don't even know how that happened. I didn't mean to yell. I didn't mean to slap. I didn't mean to lose my temper. I didn't mean to get drunk. 
I didn't mean to do any of the hundreds of things we do when we're not fully present and conscious. It's because this groove has gotten so deep, this patterning has gotten so set that they go together. So that's what expression tends to do. Then we have suppression, also not a good plan. Suppression creates just festering inside us. We haven't actually treated it. All we've done is pushed it down. And then it festers in us. It becomes depression. It becomes illness. It grows inside of us. So what's the third option? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Whether someone meant to do it or didn't mean to do it, either way. We forgive. Not because what people do isn't wrong, but because we need to be free. The F of forgiveness also stands for freedom. Forgiving lets us be free. We don't forgive because on some level we feel like what you did was wrong. I was betrayed, I was cheated, I was abused, I was, you know, I got the short end of the stick. It was wrong what happened to me. And if I forgive, if I let go, then somehow the universe is going to absolve you of the karmic fruit of what you did. But the law of karma is such that we don't have to be the karmic police. God has not come down and said, do me a favor. Stand here, hold on to this, and make sure I don't forget to give this guy his karmic due. None of us has been appointed the karmic police. The law of nature is such that what people do, what seeds they plant, will bear fruit. We don't have to stand over that seed reminding it that it's an apple seed and therefore it has to become an apple tree, that it's a peach seed, it has to become a peach tree. The law of nature will take care of it. We let go for us. Then we come to ego. There's a lot more we can say about anger, but I want to make sure to quickly touch on all of them. Come to ego. Ego is what binds us. Ego is that vice, literally, in which we cannot breathe. Our ego is that which prevents us from being able to connect with other people. The ego identifies as this physical being. I am my body. I am my degrees. I am my bank account. I am my success. I am my titles. The ego is looking to forge identities. That's what the ego does. Who am I? The ego is always looking for another, another brick to lay in the temple of itself. And so we're constantly acquiring titles, degrees, personalities, identity aspects, until this, this identity, this ego, becomes so small that it's its own cell and we suffocate in it. And it doesn't matter whether our ego tells us that we are the best, whether it's a cell made of gold, or whether our ego tells us that we're the worst. A cell made of mud, dirt. It's a cell all the same. 
We're locked up in it. The ego is that which prevents us from understanding that who we are is the divine, is consciousness, is the creator, and that we're therefore one with everyone else. The ego says, I'm separate. You're separate, I'm separate. And it locks me up over here. The ego objectifies the world so that everyone in the world is an object. Either an object that's going to help me get what I want. So you are an object of my lust. You're an object of my greed. I'm going to be able to use you in some way, whether to fulfill the desires of the flesh, whether to fulfill the desires of my, my ego, my identity, my title. Or you are an object that's a hurdle on my path. And I have to remove you. But either way, what the ego does is separate us. I'm an object, you're an object. When the truth of our existence and the source of our peace, of our, our knowing, not our book knowledge, but our real knowing, the source of all joy is in connection. That's why love feels so good. Whether we're, we're loving a spouse, whether we're loving a parent, whether we're loving a child, whether we're loving a pet, whether we're loving a tree, whether we're loving the divine in form, without form, whether we're loving a sunset, it doesn't matter. We're connecting. We're connecting to spirit, to essence. And that's where the joy comes. The ego doesn't let that happen. So the ego is an incredible hurdle. And it has to be not destroyed. I always, I always try to encourage people not to talk about fighting the ego. You know, we always talk about, I'm going to annihilate my ego, fight the ego. The problem with that is, when we wage war against aspects of ourself, regardless of who wins, and that's what the ego is, but we have to look at it. The more we run from it, the more it's able to be its big projected presence. Oh, my ego. Oh, my ego. But if we actually turn around and we literally look it in the eye, it kind of withers before our eyes. And what we see are aspects of our childhood. We see aspects of our conditioning. We see all of these different pieces that have kind of come together and formed this, this little thing within us that just wants to be seen. And the minute we see it for what it is, it no longer can exert its power. We then come to greed and temptation. I'm going to take them together. The root of temptation, the Latin root of temptation is tentare. And what it means is a test. Temptation is a test. In the teachings of Manu, we are told that desire is actually never fulfilled by the objects of desire. We are never able to actually become free of the desire by fulfilling it through the objects of it. Rather, what happens is all it does is causes the desire to grow like putting fuel in a fire. 
And so temptation and greed are this cycle. Desires do nothing but beget more desires. We are always told that the answer to what we need, the answer to our peace, the answer to our joy is just one thing outside. If I just could have this. There's a great story that my Guru Puja Swamiji tells of when he had gone with his Guru to Kashmir, to Dal Lake, decades ago, and they'd taken a group of devotees and they had spent initially a week and then they ended up spending a month on this houseboat in Dal Lake. Paradise, he said. Nobody wanted to leave after one month, I mean after one week, after two weeks, Finally, after a month, they had no choice but to leave. And Swamiji had told one of the devotees to go and to give the boatman, who had served them so beautifully for this month, to go and to give him some you know, extra, extra prasad. He was a poor man. After even paying whatever the, the fees were, to go give him something extra. He had been so good. And when this devotee went to the boatman, the boatman said, no, 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 I don't, I don't need more money, but, but I want to meet Swamiji for a moment, alone. I need a special blessing. So the devotee came back to Swamiji and said, he wants to meet you. He said, okay. So the devotee gets down on his knees to Swamiji and he says, I need one blessing from you. I said, sure. He says, I don't know what horrible karma I've done in this birth, in my previous births, that I'm stuck here. He said, just give me the blessing that I should be able to go to Bombay. <laughs> and Swamiji said it was amazing because the boat was full of people from Bombay, from Delhi, from Calcutta, who couldn't get enough of Dal Lake. And here this boatman who lived in Dal Lake was dreaming of Bombay, feeling that he had done some horrible karma to get stuck in the middle of Dal Lake. And it's such a beautiful story and yet each of us could tell the same story every day in our lives. This is the, the insidiousness of both the games that the mind plays as well as the games that the not conscious media plays. Whatever we want to sell, I sell it through happiness. So if you actually take a study and you start looking at advertisements, in most magazines, in newspapers, in TV commercials, what you'll see is people are not actually selling items. What they're selling is happiness and peace through the items. So if I want to sell you a car, I'm not going to tell you typically about how many airbags it has or its safety features or its anti-lock brakes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a picture or a TV commercial of children in the back seat who are singing. A beautiful man driving with a beautiful woman on his arm. And if our children try to strangle each other in the back seat of the car, the, the subliminal unconscious message that we're getting is that we've got the wrong model of car. And if we, just, if we just bought this model of car, our children too would sing in the back seat. If I drove this model of car, I too would have a beautiful woman on my elbow sitting next to me rather than my wife who's telling me when to speed up, when to slow down, when to change lanes. We're selling, not cars, we're selling happiness, we're selling peace, we're selling happy families. And whatever ad you look at, whether it's watches or mobiles or cars or clothes, 
soap. We're selling happiness. My favorite example of this, the one that I always share, is if you look at commercials for soap, nobody ever talks about cleanliness. No commercial for soap ever tells you about parts per million of bacteria that this brand removes compared to parts per million that that brand removes. Commercials for soap always have us with beautiful people who are lathering up in the shower while they sing and then they go out and their, their beautiful family is waiting for them. Or they walk out to the you know, to the bus stand and somebody says, oh, you smell so good. We're selling, we're selling fulfillment and love. Not cleanliness. Not antibacterial natures. And so what temptation and greed do is they make us pawns in the hands of everyone who wants to sell us something. And the most tragic part of this is that in order to sell us, they have to first convince us that there is lack and scarcity. 24 hours left of the sale, only two tickets left. This is how we sell things. Offer ends in two hours. Fine for advertising, no problem. I'm not anti-advertising. The problem is that we've taken this model of scarcity and lack into our own lives. And even though the sale at the mall might only be two more days, there may only be five tickets left at that price. In our lives, in creation, in that which we really need, there is no lack, there is no scarcity. But we operate like that. Think about it for a moment. Are you really able, fully and a hundred percent able, to rejoice in other people's success? To rejoice in other people's happiness? Someone we know falls in love, has children, gets a promotion. There's some little part of us, unless it's our own child, some little part of us, as much as we want to fully rejoice, some part that always holds back from being able to rejoice because we feel on an unconscious level as though somehow there were a finite pie of success, of love, of happiness. And if this person has just gotten a really big piece, it means there's less of the pie for us. And that's a tragic way to live. There is no scarcity. There is no finite pie of love, of happiness, of success. But because we've been so indoctrinated into this model, not only do we, do we shop with a frenzy, but we also are not able to rejoice in oneness with others. Because their happiness, their love, their success has taken a little something away from us. And so the model has to be one of abundance. And when the model is of abundance, then there's no place for greed. Because greed is hoarding. Greed is, I want to hold on to this pie. There's not going to be enough tomorrow. When we recognize abundance, and that, that's what Indian culture actually is at its core. This was one of the things that touched me so deeply when I first came here. Having come in from the West and the prosperous West, I came from a land where people had everything but never felt satisfied. There was always 
one more thing I needed. If you asked people, how are you? You got, you know, a litany of everything that was wrong. Oh, the maid didn't show up today. Oh, the, you know, grocery store was out of my brand of breakfast cereal. Oh, I, you know, injured my knee in this. And here, in Rishikesh, I was surrounded by people who lived well below the Western standards of poverty. And when you said to them, how are you? Oh, sab Bhagwan ki kripa, sab Ganga ki kripa, sab Swamiji ki kripa. These were people who begged me to come home for a meal. People who had nothing, people for whom feeding me a meal would mean that, that their entire weekly budget for sabji was gone. But all they wanted to do was feed. Not out of a sense of obligation, but out of a sense of abundance. It was always funny because I would say, no, 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 because of course I was told never eat out, you know, so I never, I never went anywhere. And they'd say, okay, at least, at least you have to come, come for a cold drink, have a cold drink. And even in America, I never drank soda. But of course, people think if you're from America, you must like to drink, you know, Coke and Pepsi. And I would say, no, no, no. And they would send the child out into the market to spend, you know, half the day's wages on a bottle of Coke or Pepsi for me. Because their felt sense experience was, our cup runneth over. And this actually is the root of Indian culture. It's actually the root of, of the heritage. Thanks. It's the root of the heritage. But we're losing it slowly as we're getting swept up into the, the indoctrination of the West, which is a model of scarcity. It is a model of lack. It is a model of individuality, me against you, pulling yourself up. And that's why in the West, rates of depression and anxiety and sleeplessness are rampant. But our culture is a a culture of abundance. So we just have to go back to that. And then very, very quickly, because we're at 5.30, and I want to open it up for questions, but very quickly, stress and attachment. We're attached, not just to possessions, but we're attached to how things should be. This was the expectation I was talking about when I spoke about anger. And our attachment to these things prevents us from being able to experience peace because we have, we have gotten a death grip on our own lives, whether it's our possessions that we're terrified of losing, our bank balance, we're terrified of losing, our title, our career, we're terrified of losing. And so we work 100-hour work weeks, we forsake our health, our family, our spirituality. Whether we're attached to our idea of how things should be, what our children should do, what our spouses should do, how the world should operate. But these, these preconceived notions are literally death grips. And they suffocate us. And they create stress. Stress is the response that leads to anger. When things don't go my way, I'm stressed. I'm stressed even at the possibility they may not. Anger comes only once they already haven't gone my way. But stress, stress happens even before they haven't gone my way. It's such an illness. 
that my fever, my fever starts before the weather even changes. My fever starts before you sneeze on me. Because I'm so afraid of the possibility that you could sneeze on me and give me a virus that I've already wrapped, wrapped myself up into it. I'm so afraid that what I have, what I own, could be taken. I'm so afraid that something could happen wrong in my life, in my family's life, that through my stress, I've already created that something wrong. What it means is, at its core, I don't have faith. Because if I have faith, then there's no reason to be stressed. If you've got to get to the airport for a flight, and you're with your trusted driver who you've had for 20 years, who knows every in and out of the back streets, you're not going to worry. Even if you're running a bit late, you'll be able to read the newspaper or read a spiritual book or talk on the phone or meditate. Because you know, ha ha, poncha denge. Tik se poncha denge. But if your driver's out of town, and you've had to get a taxi. You're going to be very worried. Does he know the way? Does he know the shortcut? Am I going to get there on time? He's taken the wrong way. Because we don't have faith. And in our lives when we get stressed, when we're attached to a particular way, what it means is we don't have faith in who's driving us. If we have faith in God, faith that the sun's going to rise every day, faith that the rain is going to fall, faith that flowers are going to blossom, apple trees are going to give apples, then we have to have faith that that same intelligence, that same grace is taking care of us as well. We may not be able to see the exact divine plan, but we have to have faith in it. And so the minute we find ourselves getting stressed, the antidote to stress is to have faith. To understand we, we are being taken care of. There is a higher knowing, and it doesn't matter what name, what form, however we envision the divine, worship the divine, doesn't matter. But that capital P planner understands and is taking care of me, just as everything in nature, everything in the universe is being taken care of. And my attachment is the death grip that is suffocating myself, suffocating my loved ones, and preventing things from blossoming. I remember, and I'll conclude with this, before I came to India, I lived in San Francisco, and <clears throat> I had a a little garden outside my kitchen window. And I liked to grow herbs and things. And I had, just, I had just moved from one house to another house. When I had moved, a friend of mine had given me her cat. It's a long story. I won't go into it. But she had to leave town and needed someone to take care of her cat. So I had said, sure, I'll take care of your cat. I plant a garden outside my kitchen window in these beautiful pots. And it's not growing. Not growing, not growing. Seeds are planted. Days go by, nothing's sprouting. Can't figure it out. Okay, maybe those seeds were not right. I get new seeds. That also doesn't work. Maybe those seeds aren't right. 
This goes on for a couple of months, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out why these seeds are not sprouting. And one day I look out, and I see the cat doing like this in the dirt, playing with the pots. And suddenly I understood, well, of course, if the cat is digging up the seeds, naturally they're not going to sprout. Not because the seeds are bad, not because the sun isn't right, not because the rain isn't right, not because I've planted them in the wrong way, but because they're being constantly dug up. And this is what happens in our lives. If we just plant those seeds with faith and don't keep digging them up, to see if they're sprouting. Don't keep playing with them. Don't keep tossing them around. They will sprout. They will blossom. They will flower. But if we suffocate them, if we deprive them of the oxygen that they metaphorically need, they'll suffocate. And so faith is letting go. I will, I'll conclude here so that we have, have a few minutes for some questions. Questions either on what I spoke or questions on something that you wish I had spoken on that I didn't speak on. Nation, the process of continued growth uh, through births. And yet, uh, there is a very large population of the world which doesn't believe in it at all, right? Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the West. How do you explain this disconnect? How do we explain the, the disconnect between those who believe and those who don't believe? Mm -hmm. Sure. Do this or else you are going to burn in hell. Do this or else these are the consequences. And so we've used religion really as a form of behavior management and behavior modification. And, and that's very sad because it's deprived so many people of the depth of what religion really is. We go to church or we go to synagogue, not to deepen our connection with God, but we go because if we don't, we're going to suffer the consequences. In terms of the concept of reincarnation, for me, it's not so much a matter of why they don't believe. I think you could go back anthropologically or sociologically and look up how different religious strands came, and it's very interesting. But to me, what's of, of most importance is how can we help people of every religion? Because reincarnation is not a religious thing. It's a law of nature. There's, regardless of your religion, there's lots of proof, and there's lots and lots of people working in the West, in the Judeo-Christian traditions, doing research on reincarnation and past lives. So the evidence is there. What matters most, I feel, is how can we help people know that it exists so that we can live our lives in accordance with it. We've all got freedom of belief. But that doesn't mean that the universe adapts to my belief. So I may say I don't believe in gravity. Fine, that's my prerogative. Nobody's going to say you must believe in gravity. But not believing in gravity does not mean that if I walk off a building, I'm not going to plummet to the earth. And so not believing in gravity even though it's absolutely my prerogative, I've got free will of what to believe, what not to believe, I'm the only one who's going to suffer 
because I'm going to make choices based not on a law of nature, but based on how I've decided I'm going to interpret that. And this is where we see so much suffering. Because if there isn't reincarnation, if this is all we have, then why not be decadent? Why not eat, drink, and be merry? Why bother with so much? I mean, if I can, if I can fulfill myself through, you know, chocolate cake and dance parties and funny movies, why not? If there's nothing deeper than myself, if who I am, because see, not believing in reincarnation implies that I don't believe in the soul. Because if I believe in the soul, then by definition I have to believe that when the body dies, something lives on. What happens to it exactly are told differently by different lineages. But if I don't believe that there is anything that happens after I die, then it means I don't believe in the existence of a soul. It means I believe that all I am is this body. So if all I am is this body, then why not give it whatever it wants? Why bother connecting with essence? Why bother looking within for peace and joy? Why not just go to the movies every time I feel miserable or <coughs> get drunk or eat chocolate cake? And so that's, that's the equivalent of walking off of buildings because I don't believe in gravity. I'm the only one who's going to suffer. The law exists whether I believe in it or not. And this is why we actually see, I think, so many people from the West turning toward India, turning toward this culture and teachings, not because they're looking to convert to Hinduism, but because this culture has within it teachings and understandings about the law of nature that are so deep that it helps people of every religion. I mean, as, as Puja Swamiji, my guru, always says, the, the teachings of Hinduism, the teachings in India of our culture, regardless of what we call it, have nothing to do with converting people's religion. It has to do with helping you stay in whatever religion you are, but have a deeper connection with that religion, have a deeper connection with yourself, become a better, more evolved human being. It's not about changing religions. It's not about if you're a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or Sikh or Jain or atheist. It doesn't matter. These truths are truths that help us live deeper lives. So by knowing that there is reincarnation, I know that I'm a soul, which means that I don't identify as the body. I don't value myself based on what my income is or what I look like or what my titles are. It means that I don't view others based on their looks or their titles or their careers or their bank balances because I recognize they are also a soul. I'm able to connect with them on a very deep level because I recognize that we're actually one soul, not separate souls. It means that I'm going to look for depth in my life because I want to know who is the I that lives on. Okay, this body is going to keep changing. Even science tells me that. Every seven or eight years, every cell in my body regenerates. I'm not even the same person I was seven or eight years ago. Forget who I was in a past birth. I keep getting new bodies. So even if I don't necessarily believe in reincarnation from life to life, we have to believe in reincarnation in this body. The body keeps regenerating. So we're getting new bodies constantly even within the same birth. 
who's the I that stays constant? So that's why the teachings of the East have such a depth that even people from the West are turning toward it, looking for that depth to go back and to bring into their, their same religions, but to augment that with deeper understanding. What is our time? Over time. Perfect. Perfect timing. Wonderful.